Good evening, brothers and sisters and uh, friends. We come tonight to consider a subject um, that is the disciple and protest. Now, I just have a little disclaimer before we begin. Um, sometimes people like to twist what is being said, grab a sound bite, and people become an offender for a word. So uh, a little disclaimer, tonight's talk is not about racism. It's about protest. So we're going to talk about the disciple and protest and how these things come together. Now, of course, the subject comes really out of the massive protests that have gone all around the world in response to the death of um, George Floyd. And some of those protests have been peaceful and others not so much. In fact, anarchy broke out in many major cities of the United States, violence, riots, looting, uh, arson, arcan uh, anarchy, um, pretty much on, on a scale that I don't think is seen in America since maybe the Vietnam War. Now, this, of course, is, um, as you can see, the young man there holding his hand up has given rise to a cause that's been around for a little bit, and it's called Black Lives Matter. And again, we're not here to talk about the cause. We're to, here to talk about the idea of protest. It was the New York Times in uh, 2017, so long before the events that we see today, the New York Times drew the analogy that protest, um, so Black Lives Matter is democracy in action is what they say. So this idea of protest is the idea of democracy in action. So we want to take a minute and just have a look at the idea of what exactly is democracy. And, you know, when you look at the disciple and, and how we're supposed to behave in times like this, uh, when there's a lot of protest and civil unrest, we want to consider what the Bible has to say about it. Now, democracy is a word that comes to us from Greek. It is the word demos, which means the masses, and kratia, which is the idea of rule. So literal interpretation of this is the rule of the masses. And it's a form of government in which all the citizens of a nation together determine public policy, laws, actions of their state, require that all citizens have equal opportunity to express their opinion. It is basically the idea of popular sovereignty um, is, is founded on this idea of a democratic system. Now, of course, it goes back to the Greeks. That's where the word came from. And this is Aristotle, who was the tutor of Alexander the Great, who wrote a book called Politics. And this is what he has to say. Man is to live as he likes, for that, they say, is the function of liberty. Inasmuch as to live not as one likes is to live the life of a man that is a slave. Um, this is the second principle of democracy, and from it has come the claim not to be governed, uh, preferably by anybody, or failing that, to govern and be governed in turns, and this is the way in which the second principle contributes to what he calls egalitarian liberty. Now, um, I had to look up the word egalitarian, and basically this is what it is. It is uh, equal equalitarianism, um, or egalitarianism, a school of thought within political philosophy that builds from the concept of social equality, prioritizing it for all people. Egalitarian doctrine are generally characterized by the idea that all humans are equal in fundamental worth or moral status. Well, um, that's the idea that comes to us from the Greeks. Now, we've got to ask the question, you know, are the Greeks wrong? People like Socrates and Plato and Democritus and Aristotle. Um, well, if you're a man of the world, they probably sound great. But we really want to look at this from what is God's point of view on this. And for this, we turn to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, where we read, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So there's the warning that we can be spoiled by men's philosophy and vain deceit, or empty words that deceive. And so this is the concept that we're dealing with. And um, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 
that the wisdom of this world is in fact foolishness with God. For it is written, he takes the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. And so he goes on. So the point here is that God's view of man's wisdom is that man's wisdom is foolishness with God. So that's a, a fairly fundamental point that is driven home. And so when we think of man's wisdom versus God's wisdom, Isaiah writes in chapter 55, um, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. And God points out here, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So God distinguishes his way of thinking and his way of acting as completely different to what man would have us do. So when it comes to this subject or any other, uh, as a Bible-believing group of people that claim to be disciples, um, what we have to do is surrender all of our thoughts and, you know, the thoughts of society around us and bow them before God. And as it says in Romans, let God be true, but every man a liar. So he is the final answer on this subject when it comes to the idea of, you know, what is it that we're supposed to be doing? So, this is sometimes against the grain of society. It might go against what you've been taught at school or work or what the politicians say. But if we want to be the servants of God and of Christ, we have to listen to them and not to what man has to say. And we have to obey them and not what man has to say. So we want to think for a moment about God's view of man. I mean, man's view of man is, is pretty obvious. I mean, here's Rousseau, Jacques Rousseau. Um, he says, you know, people in their natural, natural state are basically good. Uh, this natural innocence, however, is corrupted by the evils of society. So he says that man starts out basically good, uh, but society and, and the environment can corrupt uh, people's principles. Um, the Bible, though, is, is completely reversed. In fact, this is a faulty premise uh, that man is basically good. I mean, man's idea is, and this is the way democracy works, if you get enough good people together, their collective decisions will win out over the few evil amongst them. That's what man has to say. Um, God would disagree with that evaluation and with Rousseau. Um, this is what he says, Proverbs 21, verse 2. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but Yahweh ponders the hearts. And Proverbs 12 and verse 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. So God looks at it and says, look, man thinks he knows what to do. He thinks his way is right, but God doesn't necessarily see it that way. And so we read in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, of the, the nature of man, the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So that's what Jeremiah tells us, is that man is not basically good, but his heart is deceitful and it's wicked. And so it's, it's something that's going to deceive him. And the Lord Jesus Christ comments on this. He tells us where evil comes from in Mark chapter 7 and verse 21. He says, from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile the man. So that's the source of evil. So that being the case, why would we want to empower that? I mean, that's, that's sort of a, an interesting thought. When you, when you look at man is basically evil, why on earth would you want to empower it? And this is what God says in Jeremiah 10 and verse 23. Or Jeremiah says, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. So as, as Christadelphians, as Bible believers, as disciples of Christ, we do not believe that we have the inherent ability or right to govern ourselves and to decide our own steps. 
Rather, what we believe is that we need to turn to the word of God and to his wisdom and counsel and get our understanding from there and be directed by his ways, because his ways, as we read in Isaiah 55, are much higher than our ways. And in fact, if we were to go to the Bible and say, well, you know, what about democracy? Is there any examples of democracy in the Bible? And when we consider this, um, what we find is that, yes, in fact, there are some examples of democracy in the Bible. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13, we read about the collective decision. And we read, enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many be there be which go in thereat. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads to life and few there be that find it. So this is um, a fairly universal principle is that the, the decision of the masses is not necessarily going to be the right one. It typically leads to destruction and few will find the way that leads to life. So when we think of democracy and, and decisions of many people, um, it certainly changes when we put it in view of this verse. We think of some examples in the Bible um, of democracy. You have Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, where the people said collectively, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top will reach to heaven, and let us make a name lest we be scattered upon the face of the whole earth. So that was a collective decision of the society at the time was to build this massive Tower of Babel. Well, what was God's response to this people power? Well, what he ended up doing, of course, was dividing the nations by tongue and essentially creating race. And so we have in Genesis 11, the Lord said, behold, the people is one and they have all one language and this they do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they imagine to do. And if you go back to Genesis chapter six, we find here that the imagination of man's heart was evil continually. So there's nothing restrained from them when they work as a collective group. And so God says, or the Elohim in this case say, go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And of course, they do this and it puts an end to this collective venture. Um, so when we when we look at that and we consider uh, what God has done in this case, um, we find that, you know, it's not the only one. There are other cases where we have a collective group, Numbers 14, children of Israel coming out of Egypt. Um, they Therefore, when Yahweh, why is they, this is what they say, why has Yahweh brought us into this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make us a captain and return let us return into Egypt. So that was a democratic decision made by the masses is that the people decided they were going to make a, a captain and they would return to Egypt. And of course, that didn't go so well. And that whole generation perished in the wilderness. Another collective decision is given in Mark chapter 15, where the fickle crowd that a week earlier had cried Hosanna uh, in the highest, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, now cries out, crucify him. And Pilate, trying to control this group, says, why? What evil has he done? And they cry out the more exceedingly, crucify him. So Pilate, willing to content the people, releases Barabbas unto them and delivers Jesus uh, when he had scourged him to be crucified. So democracy in the Bible is not necessarily a, an overly good thing. And there are actually Bible prophecies about revolution. So um, we think of decisions of the masses, you know, does that make him right? Um, democracy would say, yes, the decision of the masses is a holy thing. Well, the Bible picks up on this whole idea of revolution, and it comes up in Revelation chapter 16. Uh, in verse 13, we read there, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth to the kings of the earth and the whole world. And their end result is to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So you have these three unclean spirits like frogs, whatever they are. And the end result is they come out of the mouth of three systems. The dragon, which prophetically is Russia, 
the beast, which is Europe, and the false prophets, which is the Vatican. And they are spiritual devils working miracles. So they go out and the end result is to gather the nations to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So they assemble mankind as one against God. Now, when we, we examine this a little bit further, we say, well, what does all this mean? Well, the, the word spirit is defined by Strong's concordance, the word pneuma which we get the idea of a pneumatic break. It's a blast of air, a gentle movement of air, a gentle blast. Uh, wind, hence the, the wind itself. We can think of the wind blowing in the trees, the breath of nostrils or the mouth, a spirit or a vital principle by which a body is animated, or the rational spirit, the power by which human being thinks, feels, and decides. So this is the idea, is that this is a teaching or something in the, in the number five is really the context of what we're looking at here. It's, it's the power by which a human being decides things or thinks or feels. So it's, it's really the idea of a teaching. And this comes up in the first epistle of John, chapter four and verse one, where we're told, beloved, believe not every spirit, so every teaching, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So this is the concept here. We have a teaching that's gone out into the world and, and John tells us to try the spirits. Don't just listen to everything, but to try it, whether it is of God or not. Now, we also read in Strong's that the word devil is defined. So these are spirits of, of demons or devils. The, the Greek word is diamon, uh, a god or a goddess or an evil spirit. And um, James actually defines this for us quite well in James chapter 3, verse 15. He says, This wisdom descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. So he's talking about a specific set of ideas uh, or teachings or thinkings. And he says this is not godly wisdom. It's earthly, sensual, and it's demonic all right, it's worldly thinking. It's a spirit that drives people. And he says, where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil way. So he relates this idea of spirits of devils with confusion. And we look up that in Strong's Concordance, and we find out that it's akatatia, uh, and it means basically tumult, instability, disorder, or disturbance. So if we were to kind of roll those things together into a biblical definition, um, demonic frog spirits are teachings or doctrines which are comprised of earthly wisdom or madness, which cause instability, tumult, or disorder. They are not of God, but come from the heart of men. So that's where they originate. They come from man. Now, we ask the question, well, why frogs. When we look at the Bible to understand what this means, um, we read in Exodus 8, where we were first run into these frogs, Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, entreat the Lord that he may take away this plague of frogs from me and from my people. And he says, I will let thy people go that they may do sacrifice to the Lord. So frogs are the, the plague that come about when Pharaoh offers a false promise of liberty. So it's the first time that he says he'd let the people go, but it's false because he doesn't actually do it. It's the first promise of liberty, but it's a false promise of liberty. And when we, we look at this as it's defined in the Psalms, when, they, when it comments on the plague of frogs, he says in Psalm 78 verse 45, the psalmist writes, he sent diverse sorts of flies among them, which devoured them and frogs, which destroyed them. And the word they destroyed actually means corrupted. So we have this false promise of liberty that comes when the frogs are there, and the result is that it corrupts the people. And Peter actually interestingly brings both of these ideas together in Second Peter chapter 18, or chapter two, sorry, verse 18. He talks about people who will speak great swelling words of vanity. Uh, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped who lived in error. They promise liberty. They themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, the same as he brought into bondage. So we have here this idea of those who will promise liberty, which is what Pharaoh did, 
But at the same time, they are the servants of corruption. And the frogs we read in, 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 in Psalms corrupted the people. So when we look at this idea then of frog spirits, when we come back to it, we have the frog spirits. Um, there is a historical fulfillment to this passage in Revelation chapter 16. It comes after the period of vials, which have been the time of the French Revolution or during the period of the vials. Um, and, uh, and that's a whole other subject again. But um, one of the groups of people during this French Revolution are the Franks. And uh, they are the tenth part of the city that is referred to in Revelation chapter 16 when we read of the vials. Now, it's interesting that the word Frank literally means free. And it's identical with the ethnic name of the French. And it means free in various of applications, liberty, generous, lavish. Um, and uh, older definitions, uh, free and born in a free city, uh, desirous of liberty. So there are some of the, the definitions of the Franks. Now, it's interesting that the first king of the Franks that's recorded for us is Clovis here. And here he is being baptized by the church. And Clovis had a shield. And this is from the Reims Tapestry. And this shield has upon it frogs. Not just frogs, but three frogs on his shield. So whenever you see Clovis's uh, king of the Franks, king of the free peoples, we see these frogs here. So the frog was a symbol in history of the French, um, and that's where it comes from. It's, it's sometimes used as a derogatory term. It's actually a historical term, um, which comes from the shield of Clovis and the three frogs that he would have on his emblem. And so when we come to Revelation 16 into this very time period and we read about three unclean spirits like frogs coming from the mouth of the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. And their job is to basically gather the nations. They are spirits of devils. And we looked about that, the idea of a teaching that is that is a teaching that's going to create confusion and anarchy and it's going to corrupt people. Um, it's going to work miracles and it's going to go to the, to the kings of the whole earth and it's going to bring them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Well, when we look at the history of the French, we have, of course, the French Revolution, which had its emblem here. This is the emblem from the Revolution. And it was liberty, egality, fraternity, or liberty, equality, fraternity. So remember when Socrates was writing, um, or Aristotle, he talked about egalitarian society. So that's the equality part of it, right? So liberty, egality, or equality, and fraternity, which began back in 1789 um, with the storming of the Bastille, where a revolution began in France, where the people said, enough of the oppression, we want liberty. And so they, they came together into this triple banner of, of the frogs of liberty, equality, and fraternity, and they overthrew the government. And here is Marat. He is one of the leaders. And it's interesting that the Proverbs tell us this, Proverbs 30, verse 21 to 22, three things the earth is disquieted, and for four it cannot bear, for a servant when he reigneth. So here's a man who was a servant, and he would become now a ruler along with three other men or two other men, Robespierre and another one named Danton. So there's the three of them, Robespierre, Danton and Marat, the leaders of the French Revolution. And um, they would begin what was called the Committee of Public Safety. And Danton is kind of one of the main leaders that would overthrow the monarchy and establish the first French Republic. And it was during this first year not even a year, just 10 months, that there were 40,000 deaths and as many as 300,000 French women and men were put to death, one in 50 of, of the population. Um, they, were, they were arrested uh, during this, this time period. So 300,000 people arrested and 40,000 people put to death. And the rulers themselves uh, didn't survive. I mean, this is Marat, who was executed in 1793. And the revolution itself would see over 1,400,000 people die during the revolution and the wars that followed. So this was a great public uprising to overthrow the government, to overthrow oppression, and it would end up in 1.4 million people dying. 
Danton himself was executed. And it's interesting that the Lord says in Matthew 26, 52, put up your sword, this is what he said to Peter in his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. So it's interesting, there is the French Revolution, there is the first great experiment in socialism. And uh, a Christadelphian writer named Frank Janaway in a debate uh, on socialism had this to say. Socialism was tried on a large scale. Laws were passed to do away with misery and poverty. Indirect taxation was removed and taxes without end were put on to the rich. How did it end? Let me quote the historian. Commerce was annihilated, the rich vanished, and the tax on them brought in nothing then. The price of food rose in a terrifying fashion. Famine showed itself in Paris, Lyon, Marseille, Bordeaux, and Rouen. Uh, pallor and agony were on all faces. One million died of famine, and nearly as many more perished on the scaffold or in prison. So that was the, the, uh, the French Revolution. Um, but there have been other popular revolutions, such as communism. The revolution in France gave birth to, or socialism, I guess you could say. Uh, there was many isms that came out of this French Revolution. And, and one of them, of course, was this Charlie here named Karl Marx. And it's communism. It was put into practice by the Soviets. So we had in 1917 the end of the Soviet or the Russian Empire. And it was a, a slave or a serf uprising. Uh, state slavery served him, not exactly a good thing. And two men were responsible, Vladimir Lenin um, and Joseph Stalin, who would become the brutal dictator who would rule Russia for 30 years following uh, or throughout the Second World War. And so this was the, the United uh, Soviet Socialist Republic and um, communism. And you can see there the fist is the fight for freedom. And um, it's interesting that an individual called Rudolf Rummel, a demographer of uh, government mass murder, so this is somebody who's a statistician and, and collects numbers, estimated the number of, of uh, the death toll of the 20th century socialism in Russia or in Soviet Union to be about 61 million people. So 1.4 million died as a result of the French Revolution. 61 million people died in Russia as a result of, um, of the Soviet uh, power that came in. It wasn't the only place. Germany in 1919 was under great, uh, terrible economic circumstances. So many rose up to protest the Treaty of Versailles. And you can see these people here all protesting this Treaty of Versailles. And it wasn't for you know no reason. There was hyperinflation. Um, a loaf of bread would cost you 4.6 million marks. So you would weigh the money. You wouldn't bother counting it. You'd bring it in a wheelbarrow and you would weigh out the money to buy a loaf of bread. And you can see the people here lined up during that time. And it was a terrifically, you know, miserable time for people. And so they rallied for change. And that change came, uh, perhaps not in the form that they were expecting. And when it came, they couldn't really stop it. Um, the German Reich in 1937 with Hitler and his um, band of followers um, would cost the world 75 to 85 million people, about 3% of the world's population. And the thing in Germany is this, is like people were protesting against the Weimar Republic. They were protesting against um, this group of people. Um, but it's like the Proverbs say, the beginning of strife is when one letteth out water. Thereof leave off contention before it be meddled with. So once it starts, you can't stop it. The ESV puts it this way, quit before a quarrel breaks out. And the quarrel, of course, would be World War II. So protest is something that's been, you know, huge for many years. You can look at other places, go to the other side of the planet and go to India. The Indian independence in the 1930s, we had this Charlie, Mahatma Gandhi, and um, he would protest for self-rule in India uh, against the British government. And by 1947, some 17 years later, India would be independent, uh, British rule would end, and at the same time, Pakistan would also be independent. There'd be a massive uh, war between the two of them. Um, but within the year, not even a year, 
Gandhi is shot dead and there's riots in Bombay and so on and so forth. So the man who led the uprising and, and who was the champion of it was murdered um, within the first year of success. And again, the Proverbs tell us, my son, fear thou the Lord and the king. Meddle, and the word there is join not with them that are given to change. So you've got people who want change. And the proverb says, don't join them, for their calamity shall rise suddenly, and who knoweth the ruin of them both? And of course, that was Gandhi. His calamity rose suddenly within the year of success, quote unquote, he's dead and the country's plunged into war. So what about, though, you know, come in a little bit more modern times, what about this idea of protesting against government today and some of the things that governments do, which we see all over the world around us? Well, as a disciple, one of the things we've got to remember is that God is in charge. We read in Daniel chapter 4 and verse 17, This matter is by the decree of the watchers, the demand by the word of the holy ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever he will and sets up over it the basest of men. So, that's what the, the Bible tells us, is that God is in control in the world, and he sets up governments, and sometimes they are the basest of men. And, and as Christadelphians, that's why we don't vote. I mean, we would look at history, and we'd look at people like Clement Attlee and Ernest Bevan. Um, they ran against Winston Churchill, who was a friend of the Jews, and they were people who were very anti-Semitic. We wouldn't have voted for them. But they were the right people for that point in time because through them, uh, God would bring the Jewish population in Palestine to basically kick off um, the rule of the British and an independent state would actually come about. Um, so he uses those circumstances to do what he wants to do. And it's not like uh, protest in the past hasn't brought about good results um, you can think, you might argue that the result in India was a good result or the French Revolution was a good result to get rid of this corrupt monarchy. And in, in some senses, it was. It was the judgment of God. But that's for him to do. And as disciples, we let him rule. We don't try to decide the way things are going to go. And this, of course, is the same idea the Lord Jesus Christ puts out in, in John chapter 18, verse 36. Christ tells Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I would not be delivered to the Jews. But now is not, is my kingdom not from hence. So the Lord Jesus Christ himself refused to involve himself in the fight of the current day because he says, this is not my place. My kingdom is not of, my, of this world. It's not about the here and now. And that, of course, is the, the patriarchal spirit. Um, we read in Hebrews 11, 13, all these died in faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, they dwelt in tents, we read further on back in the chapter. Um, but they, 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 they received not the promises, but having seen them far off and greeted them from afar, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. I think that's the wrong translation I meant to put on. So these all died in faith, not having received the promise, having confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims. Right, So this is more the idea um, that we have, but, but that's the concept. They were strangers and exiles or pilgrims on the earth. They didn't belong to this society. They did not involve themselves in it. They remained separate. And that's what we are exhorted to do. Peter tells us in, in 1 Peter 2 verse 17, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God. Honor the king or the rulers, whoever they may be. In fact, he says, servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. So it doesn't really matter whether we think the government is good or bad or the master is good or bad. We are to be subject with fear to the gentle and the good, but also the froward or the, the one that we might think is a bit of an idiot. Um, that's not our place. We are to be subject to them. This is thankworthy, he says, if we're being oppressed. If a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. And so Paul goes on in Romans chapter 13, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. 
And this is an interesting point. There's no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers, you know, and this is a general term here, they, they are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he, that is the government of the day, is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he bears not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. So that's what Paul tells us. Be subject to the higher powers because God's put them in place. If you're resisting the power, you're resisting God himself. So you've got to be subject. He's the minister of God for good. So having said that, how then could we be involved in something like this, a protest that says defund the police? Um, in other words, remove the powers that be. How could we participate in this kind of a rally? That's totally against the spirit of Peter, of Paul, of the Lord Jesus Christ, of being subject to the higher powers, and that God gave them the sword to be his ministers for good. Now, the Proverbs also tell us this, make no friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. So we are not to be partakers with emotional causes, angry people. Um, we're not to go with them. We're not to participate in their march, whatever that march might be for, lest we learn the ways of the world and they become a snare to us. And, and John, the Lord Jesus Christ, says this. He says, listen, I've given your word to the disciples. Now, he says, the world has hated them because they're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. And the Lord says, I don't pray that you would take them out of the world, but rather that you would keep them from the evil. They are not of the world as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have also sent them into the world. So that's what the Lord says. We are not of the world. We are to be sanctified or set apart. And so he says, I, I don't want them to be partakers of the evil, to be kept from that, and rather that God should, uh, should keep them. So when we look at protests then, and, and you can think of many types of protests, we are not of this world. Um, so this is the Vietnam War going to 1968. End the war madness now. Um, so this is their peace parade. And that, of course, was followed by Woodstock, where you've got over a million people in 1969 all coming together. And they're like a great big mass of people. there, a sea of peoples all standing to protest against the Vietnam War by way of having this music concert. Now, what of that? Well, this is what Isaiah 57 says. He says, the wicked are like a troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. So you see a great host of people like that. It's like a great big sea casting up mire and dirt. And they're all there protesting for peace. And God says, there is no peace for the wicked. So it's a completely futile protest. How does peace come? Well, Isaiah 32 tells us the work of righteousness shall be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. So when it comes to peace and protest for peace, whatever form that might be, it really comes from the work of righteousness and the effect of righteousness, not from mass demonstration. And you think of Woodstock, you know, a million people meeting together for uh, a peace campaign, engaging every form of immorality under the sun, they're never going to find peace. But you can look at all kinds of different things. Like, just think of this. This is a march in, in the 1970s in Britain for women's liberation. And you can see there that same fist going up, um, the, this, this protest. But, you know, and... We might not disagree with everything, um, but I just want you to note one of the little signs here. Equal pay is not enough. We want the moon. And you know, that's the thing about protest. 
is it never is satisfied. And that's what the, the Proverbs tell us. Proverbs 27 verse 20, hell and destruction are never full. The eyes of man are never satisfied. It will never be good enough. But now there's another side to this. When we look at protest, and, and um, Brother Paul mentioned this in his Bible in the News a little while ago, uh, a couple of weeks back, and um, it's the hidden agenda that basically there are forces at play that will hijack protests for their own means. And I would encourage you to go back and watch that Bible in the News. This is what the Bible has to say. Proverbs 26, verse 20. Where there is no wood, there the fire goes out. So where there is no talebearer, strife ceaseth. As coals, to burning, uh, or as coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is contentious man to kindle strife. The words of a talebearer are as wounds. They go down into the innermost parts of the belly. So that's what happens when people work to spread tales and to incite um, strife. Now, when we look at some of the protests in the last, you know, 50 years or so, 40 some years, 1981, we had the Polish Solidarity Movement. So we're talking about, you know, protests in Poland against the oppression of communism and, and the Soviet rule. Interesting, of course, that, you know, Soviet Russia was uh, uh, came about as a response to the Tsars. So a revolution was kicked in to overthrow Tsardom, and now another revolution is being kicked in to overthrow communism. One individual during this time really um, was, uh, was uh, the one that was sort of like really uh, kind of crystallized this, and this was Lacluenza. But behind Lacluenza, we had, of course, Pope John Paul II. And it's a historically noted fact, his involvement in the strife that would come up in, in, in Poland as he was influencing behind the scenes to have um, this all take place. And that wasn't just Poland. It also went into Germany. This is 1988. Um, the great freedom marches um, that were of the Volk, as you can see there, which is the people, uh, the German word for people. So if you think of Volkswagen, right? So that's the people wagon, the people's car. Well, this is the Volk, the people. And the people are now rising up against this government. And it was in 1989 that, you know, it was toppling communism again, and it was very successful. And behind the scenes, as we've mentioned, was the papacy. And in this case, Ronald Reagan working very hard as well. And, and you know, it's again, it's, it's an established fact. I mean, some people will say, oh, this is some kind of a Christadelphian conspiracy theory. But there are books written, such as this one, The Divine Plan which talk about the power of the Pope to change this. In fact, there was an article that came up just this last couple of weeks, June 2020. This is from a, a, a publication called The Imaginative Conservative, and it says this. Pope John Paul II lit the long spiritual fuse in Poland in 1979, which would burn for 10 years across Central and Eastern Europe, exploding beneath the Berlin Wall in 1989. The aftershocks of this spiritual, moral, and political earthquake toppled the remaining shell of the Soviet Union in 1991. While Mikhail Gorbachev in Russia and President Reagan in America played crucial political and military roles in these events, Pope John Paul II was the spiritual leader of this peaceful revolution that shattered communism, freeing 400 million. So there is proof positive, um, and this is a Catholic publication, by the way, uh, basically claiming that it was the Pope's work in undermining this whole thing and bringing about this revolution that would undermine uh, communism and would bring about the new state of affairs in Europe, which, of course, has allowed for the, um, the European Union to come back together again. We can think of other things, apartheid in the 1980s. Here's a uh, great long... Uh, uh, protest looking for the ANC, a march for the, the end of apartheid and for the release of Mandela. And here is Mandela being released. And you can see him holding up the fist of protest there that we've seen before. And um, again, who was behind the scenes pulling the levers? 
Well, here is Pope John Paul II as well. And of course, it's not just in South Africa and in Europe, it's also in the Middle East. This is October 1989. Pope John Paul says, I wish to make my own the legitimate request of the Palestinian people to live in peace in their own country. It would be wrong to remain indifferent to such cries as the daily sufferings of so many people. Interesting when Pope Pius XII remained completely silent to the suffering and the size of the Jews during the Holocaust, but here he is inciting uh, violence, and that's exactly what happened after the visit of, um, of the Pope to Israel. We had the Intifada strike out, and, um, and we've seen it with every Pope since, Benedict and also Francis. And it's interesting that Benedict in 2009 said that, this is talking about the financial crisis, he says, this crisis becomes an opportunity for discernment in which to shape a new vision for the future. In this spirit, with confidence rather than resignation, it is appropriate to address the difficulties of the present time. And he goes on to talk about what he's going to do. But the point here is that the papacy seizes upon these revolutions and they use them to turn things to their own control, as Paul talked about in his Bible in the News about America and the riots in America. And, and that's something I think that we need to recognize. And now it's not a question of race. We're not talking about race. We're talking about the powers that are hijacking these movements behind the scenes for their own purposes. And you can look at this. We have the Arab Spring of 2011. Um, there was the awakening, as it was called, by the Economist magazine there. You can see the, the fist going up. And it was throughout um, Libya and uh, Bahrain, Egypt, Tunisia. Um, long live the revolution, a game over Mubarak, right? So this is all the things that basically it's, it's listed off here. Tunisia, Algeria, Yemen, Jordan, Syria, Saudi Arabia, and the world, right? So this was the call that was going on. And we've seen it even recently in Hong Kong, 2019. Uh, revolution again, you can see the fists held high. And again, this is um, France, the Yellow Vest uh, Crusades in 2020, uh, 2019, 2020, basically through last year and into this year uh, before COVID broke out. And it's interesting, this was a mural in France. And you see there um, the woman, uh, the Lady of Revolution, and she's surrounded by these Yellow Vestas. So they see their protest as basically a continuation of the French Revolution. And so when we see these kinds of things going on in the world around us, no matter what the cause might be, we've got to recognize that our place as disciples is not to throw our lot in with them. In fact, Proverbs chapter 1 in verse 15 says, My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path, for their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. And we've seen that in the U.S. as these riots turned into anarchy and there was murder and bloodshed and, and looting and so on and so forth. It reminds us of the words of Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. So really, you know, pick an issue. Uh, what is it that we're supposed to be about? You know, there's lots of issues, protests, civil unrest. Um, you could look at pro-life pro uh, rallies, and we might agree with, with some of, um, of, of the sentiment. Um, but you then equally have the pro-choice rally about, you know, abortion is my human right. Um, we then have, you know, rallies for climate change. Um, and note here the political sign on the cardboard. Uh, the one that's behind Climate Action Now says, not my prime minister. So they're campaigning for climate change. And it's all about government change. So it's, it's a climate protest that's trying to change government. So you can see how very quickly these things become unglued. And of course, the, the, the environmental one really comes down to the kids very quickly. 
create solutions, not pollutions. And you know, the one has the sign there, you know, we've gone through the Ice Age, the Stone Age, now the Garb Age, right? So um, quite creative and interesting. But the point is, is that this has become the new morality for many people. So getting involved in this climate change thing, while it might sound good and people rest versus like, you know, those who destroy the earth, which is really the word is corrupt. It's talking about moral corruption, not um, plastic pollution. Um, the world goes mad with this. And, and really, it, it comes like the words of, of Romans chapter 1 and verse 24 about people who change the truth of God into a lie. And they end up worshipping and serving the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So they're more interested in saving koalas and and uh, penguins and dolphins and whales and stuff like that than they are in serving God. Now, there's nothing wrong with serving um, or, or trying to save penguins and dolphins and whales and so on. Like, that's not the point. The point is, is it's a change in morality. In fact, environmentalism has become the new morality. This was an interesting doormat. The 11th commandment, thou shalt recycle. And really, that's the way it's become all the way around the world. We, we have this idea of, you know, what does it mean to be a good citizen? It means to reduce, reuse, recycle. Being a good citizen, the kid's guide to community involvement, you know, how we can recycle and books about why I should save water, why I should recycle, etc., etc. Um, we are extremely good recyclers. So instead of learning the Ten Commandments now, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, to love the Lord thy God, etc., etc., we learn thou shalt recycle, thou shalt save money, thou shalt um, be a good citizen this way. And this is the way the world has gone. It's become the new morality. Now, we also have, um, you know, kind of that Salvation Army mentality, the loaves and the fishes. Um, and this is one where we've got to be careful of our involvement with this as well, because it's, it's interesting that, you know, we have in the Bible a statement about, look, you know, as believers, we have an obligation to those who are of, of lesser um, standing in, in a sense or, or the poor. Um, this is Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, so when these things present themselves, let us do good to all men, especially those who are of the household of faith. And note that little phrase there, because it's not about just going out and, and being do-gooders. We are to do good to all men when opportunity presents. So, I mean, like these are things where, you know, you might have in your life a neighbor or somebody who's in hard times and they come to you for help when you have opportunity. So we do good to all men. But the emphasis here is especially those who are of the household of faith. And, and that's what James picks up in James chapter 1. He says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless, the widows, and their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So showing the character of God is about looking after the fatherless and the widows. That's what God is. We think of Ruth. We think of the law. It was written to take care of the fatherless and the widows. And of course, don't forget there to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. I mean, God tells us, be ye holy, for I am holy. Now, this isn't sweeping instruction to join the Salvation Army and, and their type of soup kitchen sort of ministries. That's not what God intends for us to do. In fact, James goes on to say, what does it profit a man, my brethren? Um, sorry, what does it profit my brethren? Though a man say he has faith and has not works, can faith save him? And note again the context. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give not the things which are needful to the body, what doth a profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. So again, the emphasis was, ecclesially speaking, within the congregations, they were to look after those who were in need. It wasn't necessary that they were sent out into the world to do this. They were to look after those that came under the auspices of the Ecclesia. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ makes the comment in John 6. After the, the feeding of the 5,000, you know, um, it wasn't about humanitarianism. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, verse 26, You seek me, 
not because you saw the miracles. It wasn't about his message and the power of God and the miracles. He says, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. That's human nature. And so he tells the disciples and, and the followers, labor not for the meat which perishes, but for the meat which endures to everlasting life which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. So the Lord Jesus Christ instructs those at that time not to put their effort into meat that perishes, but meat that endures for everlasting life. Now the same is true for us. Our effort is not to be humanitarian, so to speak, and, and saving souls uh, on a daily basis in the sense of, you know, food and that kind of thing. That's not, he said, don't put your effort there. Don't labor for the meat that perishes. It's not about meal a day and stuff like that. He says, put your effort into the meat which endures for everlasting life. And so this is the idea that we have. And, and we think of um, the adage in the world around us. You know, there's this, there's this phrase that was picked up by a Christian woman years ago. Actually, I think it comes from the Chinese originally. And this is what it says, give a man a fish and feed him for a day. But if we go beyond that, it says, you know, teach a man to fish and feed him for a lifetime. But for us, it's way more than that, because what we can do is be fishers of men and show people the way to the tree of life where they can eat and live forever. Now, the Salvation Army can't do that. Your Meals on Wheels group cannot do that. Meal a day is not about that. What we are to be about is being fishers of men so that we can bring people to the tree of life where they can eat and live forever. That's the emphasis that the Lord Jesus Christ commissions the disciples to go out and do. That's their role. That's what they've got to be about. So when we think of changing the world, whether it's the environment, whether it's pro-life, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whatever it might be, all of which may be nothing wrong with any of those things per se, um, although they can become politicized very quickly, as we've seen, what our commission is, is to bring people to the Lord. Show people the way to the tree of life where they can eat and live forever. And this is what, of course, we are instructed to do. The Lord in Matthew 4 verse 19 says, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And so how would they be fishers of men? Well, Mark 16, 15, he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved but he that believeth not shall be damned. That is the commission of the disciples, to go and seal the servants of God in their foreheads. That's what we've got to be about. We are not about, um, you know, soup kitchens, Black Lives Matter, um, pro-life environment, all of those things. Um, if we have opportunity to help somebody, as we're told, do good to all men, especially those of the brotherhood, but do good to all men. But that's not to be our focus. Many people are focused on the different issues and they want to change the world. But as we've seen, change in the world can turn into communism that can create this empire that then 100 years later is turned on its head by another revolution. Um, and you just have revolution after revolution. And often they are not the principles of Christ that are being brought into these things. Some people may have them as their motive. Um, and in Christ, when we get into preaching like this, um, this is what we have to do. We have to be blind to race. There is no race in it. I mean, we read this in Galatians, don't we? Like this is when we think of going out to preach and we think of going to spend, spread the gospel message. I mean, well, the apostle Peter says, look, you know, um, well, I think it's Paul actually who says, you know, God would have all men everywhere to repent, right? So it's not, he doesn't discriminate against who is invited. We invite all men everywhere to repent. And that's really the issue. So in Galatians, we find here um, in Galatians chapter three, a verse that we often read when it comes to the idea of baptism, we're told there, we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. As many as you has have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And there's no discrimination in Christ. There's neither Jew nor free. 
uh, Greek, sorry, there's neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So our mission is to preach to anybody. And in fact, it's usually the poor that will listen more because not many mighty, not many noble, not many of the high ranking of this world are, are called. But God's called the weak things of this world to confound the wise. So we, we go out and we speak the truth in love to our, to our, our fellow man. Um, and this is what we're exhorted in Philippians 2, verse 15 to 16. Be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and a perverse nation, among whom we're supposed to shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. That's what we have to do. This is not our world right now. We will be called up to government when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. And we read about it, and we've just read it in our, in our readings in Revelations chapters 4 and 5, where John has that vision and that voice tells him to come up hither. And he's invited up finally into the political heavens. And when the saints do join the Lord Jesus Christ, this new administration, that's what's going to change the world. Not any political or social change that would, would come about right now. Um, but we read about it in Psalm 72, the psalm about the Lord Jesus Christ. We read, he shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy. He will break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear as long as the sun and the moon endure. Throughout all generations, he shall come down like rain upon mown grass, as showers that water the earth. In his day shall the righteous flourish and the abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. He shall have dominion from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. So again, that fruit of righteousness is peace. When the, peace, when the Lord comes and institutes a righteous society, then we will have finally peace upon the earth. And so we read in Micah chapter 4 and verse 4, They shall sit every man under his vine, and every man under his own fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of Yahweh of hosts has spoken of it. And so this, of course, applies to the people of Israel as they're brought back to the land. But as that kingdom age spreads throughout the whole world, people will enjoy this benefit. So this is what we are to look forward. So just turn, if you would, in your Bibles to our last passage in, in 2 Peter chapter 3. This is what we're looking for. We read here that in verse 7, and, and Peter's talking about AD 70 and the generation that was then, but it's applicable to us today as well. The heavens and the earth that are now, and we could say that of the society that we live in, the governments and the earth, the, the people, are basically um, kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So the wickedness in the world today is going to be dealt with. But beloved, he says, be not ignorant with one thing. One day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years one day. Verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, would, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So that's the thing. It doesn't matter who, Jew, Greek, bond, free, black, white, yellow, whatever the race, creed, nationality, all people are invited to leave whatever it is they're in and join themselves to the Lord. And that's the same thing that's going to happen in the kingdom age. And he goes on to say, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens, the, the governments are going to pass away with great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So whether we want to talk about inequalities, racism, wickedness, whatever it is, it's all going to be burned up. All those wicked ways are going to be removed because righteousness is going to be taught to the people. And so he says in verse 11, seeing that all these things shall be dissolved, what should the focus be? What manner of persons ought we to be? in all holy conversational lifestyle and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And so the exhortation to us is, wherefore, beloved, seeing ye look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. 
And so that's what we have to be about, brothers and sisters and, and young people and friends. We need to be about preaching the truth, holding forth the word of life, drawing people to the Father as the Lord Jesus Christ did, sealing people in their foreheads, not about providing them a fish for a day, but providing them access to the tree of life where they can eat and live forever. That is our commission. That is what we have to be about and not to get drawn in with the world and its protests and its politics and all the things that it does. Thank you very much for your attention.